Hello everyone. This is the fifth part of the story I'm Voldemort. Chapter 35. Laying Down the Law, Part 1. After witnessing the other Slytherin students being portaled away, Druella didn't have any idea what was going on anymore. Her friend that she thought was a Muggleborn is actually the heir to Slytherin. He hid this from everyone, including her, for two whole years. The only question running through Druella's mind right now is why. Why did you hide that you're the heir for so long? You could have walked into Slytherin like a king. She clarifies. Yes, but then I would be surrounded by snakes that would try to become my friend because of that. By waiting, I gained a true friend that would ruin her reputation for me. Also, I wanted to use this opportunity to get close to the other houses. As the bullied and shunned Slytherin, I was able to make a good connection to the rest of the houses. Other than that, I wanted to see what Slytherin is really like. I'm afraid that wouldn't have been possible with everyone trying to kiss my ass for being the heir to Slytherin. Tom says and Druella nods along agreeing with all of his words. All right, but why didn't you tell me sooner? My acclimacy has been top-notch since you started teaching me in first year, so don't use that as an excuse. Druella asks as she crosses her arms. Hmm, truthfully. I just didn't find the right time to tell you. I will tell you now that I'm hiding many things from you. Although I won't be telling you all of them this instant, you will find out about them sooner or later. That is as long as you don't betray our friendship any time soon. Tom adds the last part in almost a whisper, but Druella heard every word of it. I would never betray our friendship. She states as she stomps her foot. Good then you'll learn of all of my secrets in due time. Now, would you like to accompany me to the mirror dimension? I have new followers to convert. Tom asks as he holds out his arm for her to grab. The mirror dimension is where you sent them, right? She asks and Tom nods. How did you do that anyway? Wait, let me guess that's another secret, isn't it? You catch on quickly as always, Drew. Now we should be going. That is if you're coming along. Tom says as he gestures to his outstretched arm. Sigh, fine let's go. Druella sighs as she grabs Tom's arm. Tom opens a portal with the sling ring, and they walk casually into the mirror dimension. As Tom and Druella were talking amongst themselves, the students of Slytherin House fell safely into the mirror dimension. They were all beyond shocked and terrified. The older students tried to use apparition to teleport themselves out, but no matter how they tried, they were stuck in the mirror dimension. When the younger children saw the older students fail, they started to truly panic. What if this is their punishment for ruining the good name of Slytherin? They all thought that this is their prison to serve out their time for besmirching Tom's noble house. Suddenly, as the students were panicking, a portal opened a good distance away. Tom and Druella walk casually into the mirror dimension. As the portal opens, some of the more quick-witted Slytherins try to make a run for the exit. Before they could even get halfway, the portal closed behind Tom and Druella. Hello, how do you all like the mirror dimension? It's a very beautiful place, isn't it? Tom says as he strolls up to the crowd of Slytherin students. Get us out of here this instant. Lestrange yells as he draws his wand. This causes every member of Slytherin House to draw their wands and point them at Tom as well. Druella looked alarmed, but Tom gave her a reassuring smile. Don't worry, Drew. They can't do anything here. After all, I'm the only one that can open a portal out of here. If they were to kill me, they would be stuck here until they starve to death. To said loud enough for the students to hear him. Many of them lowered their wands after hearing this. Although some of them had other ideas floating in their heads. We don't have to kill you. We just have to get you to let us out. I wonder how you would feel about your friend Druella being raped in front of you. Would you let us out then, or would you simply watch as I brutalize her before your very eyes? Lestrange says as he eyes Druella with a perverted smile. As Lestrange said this, Briar, who was standing fairly close to him, drew his wand and aimed it at him. 
What did you say about my sis? Briar started but before he could finish with his words. Crucio. Tom drew his wand and called one of the three unforgivable spells. As the red lightning fired from Tom's wand and collided with Lestrange, he screamed in pain as he collapsed on the floor and started shaking. What did you say you would do to my friend? Tom says as he doesn't stop the red lightning from exiting his wand. Ah! Lestrange can't stop screaming as he convulses on the mirror dimension floor. The crowd of Slytherins watch on as one of their own is tortured with the best spell for the job. Fear grows in their hearts. Fear of Tom and ever getting on his bad side. Fear of the pain it would bring them and their loved ones. At that moment, it was imprinted in these children to never anger Tom Riddle. I think that's enough. Druella said from her place beside Tom. She didn't disagree with Tom using the Cruciatus curse on that idiot for threatening her purity, but she didn't want him to die, and if the torture continued he might have. She was also surprised that Tom knew one of the unforgivable curses. No, this is Tom I'm thinking of. He probably already knows all three. She thought and was correct in her assumption. Yes, you're right. Tom agrees and stops torturing the boy. As the pain stopped, Lestrange lay heaving for air on the floor. He was on the border of consciousness and couldn't understand what happened. One moment he was talking, and the next he was on the ground in unimaginable pain. Now, the Slytherin Council is now dissolved. You were given power that never belonged to you in the first place, so I'll be taking that power back as of right now. Tom says and no one dared to utter a single complaint. The council members didn't dare say a word, as they didn't want to end up like Lestrange. Also, some of them had no quarrel with Tom taking over the house. He is the heir to Slytherin, after all. As for your way out of this dimension, that will have to come at a price. Tom says as an evil smile graces his lips. Chills went down the Slytherin students' spines as they sensed the price wouldn't be small. Chapter 36 Laying Down the Law, Part 2 As the Slytherin students heard Tom say there's a price for leaving the mirror dimension, all of them knew they weren't going to like paying it. What's the price? Druella's brother is the first to ask. The price is simple. I want your utmost loyalty to me as your lord. Tom says casually as if he was asking for nothing at all. What? That is outrageous. The commotion begins and everyone starts voicing their opinion. Some seemed perfectly fine with serving Tom as he is the heir to Slytherin. Others seemed outraged about serving a Muggleborn. But then someone asked an important question. Is he a Muggleborn, or what? The second those words left a Slytherin student's mouth, everyone shut up and looked at Tom in curiosity. Even Lestrange, who was still panting on the floor from his earlier torture, looked at Tom with a questioning eye. I'm a half-blood. My mother was from a pure-blood wizarding family, while my father is a muggle. Tom says easily. What if he's lying? Someone called out from the crowd. I have no reason to lie to my future servants. A half-blood isn't much better than a muggle-born in your eyes, isn't it? If I wanted to lie, I would have said that I was pure-blood all along. Tom says and the group of children nods their heads in agreement. Now, I'll give the more stubborn bunch of you a way out of my service. Those of you that don't wish to serve me may leave this dimension by challenging me to a duel. If I win, you will swear loyalty to me as your lord. But if you win, I will allow you passage back to Hogwarts alive and healthy. After Tom's declaration, the whole crowd became silent with contemplation. The students, who recently saw Tom Crucio a fellow Slytherin right before their eyes, had no interest in being Tom's next target. They looked at Tom with wariness and knew they couldn't stand up against someone that knew at least one of the unforgivables. Some of their parents have talked of teaching them those forbidden spells, but only after graduating Hogwarts. I see that some of you may be afraid that I'll use the unforgivables in our duel. Let me make you all feel more at ease. I, Thomas Marvelo Riddle, 
swear on my magic that I won't use any of the three unforgivables during any duel that happens within the next three hours. Unless of course those duels are interrupted by those that would plot against me. Tom swears and many of the elder students smile at this development. Before they were afraid that Tom would torture them or worse throw a killing curse at them. But now they calmed down and looked a bit more sure of themselves. The majority of younger students from fourth year and down decided to take a wait and see approach. They didn't want to fight Tom in the first place, as he's known as the brightest student to enter Hogwarts in many years. If Tom would be tired out during his duels, they could easily challenge him and beat a weakened opponent. If the elder students with more experience could exhaust him, then they may have a chance to get out of here without swearing their loyalty to some half-blood. Then there was the small portion of the Slytherin students that had no problems with swearing loyalty to the heir of Slytherin. Half-blood or not, Tom is the heir to their precious founder, and they would die for Salazar Slytherin. Their parents have ingrained into these children's minds that Salazar Slytherin was the greatest of wizards. They see Tom as the second coming of Salazar, and would gladly swear themselves to him as his servants. Among this small majority stood Orion Black who truthfully was looking for an excuse to befriend Drella and Tom openly. He was taught that Slytherin was the personification of pure blood ethics and would gladly serve his heir. Although, Abraxas Malfoy was on the side of those that would wait and see. He didn't want to serve a half-blood, but he would if it's his only way out. I think I've given you all enough time to make up your minds. Tom says as he checks his imaginary watch. Those of you that wish to duel for your freedom please stand on the left, and the rest of you may stand on the right. Tom says as he motions to each side. Twenty people stood on the left while the rest all went to the right. Surprisingly, Lestrange was not among those on the left. He stood from his down position and walked to the right. He has either learned his lesson, or he's biding his time along with the rest. The group that challenged Tom is mainly seventh-year students along with some of the council members. Druella's brother was not among them though. He didn't walk to either side, as he strolled up to Tom and dropped onto one knee. I, Briar Murray Rosier, swear my loyalty to my lord, Thomas Marvelo Riddle. As his servant I will act as his sword, wand, and shield when need, provide counsel when asked, and keep his secrets even in death. I swear this oath on my life, should I knowingly break it. Druella's brother swears in front of everyone. Druella wears a truly shocked face and doesn't know what to say. She knows that Briar only did this for her. If she weren't so close to Tom already, he would never take an oath like this. I accept your oath, Air Rosier. Tom says with a small smile on his face. You may stand beside your sister while I deal with the rest. Yes, my lord. He says, rising from his position to stand near his sister. The rest of the Slytherins were surprised that the heir to the noble and ancient house of Rosier would swear his loyalty so easily. Some thought of it as jumping on the bandwagon early. With an earlier entrance into Tom's faction, he will most likely get a higher position. Suddenly, one-tenth of the Slytherin students walked straight up to Tom and swore their loyalty as well. Briar's oath caused those that followed him along with those that saw Tom as a viable lord to swear their loyalty one by one. The rest of the Slytherins watched on with shock as a good portion of their classmates and fellow heirs swore their lives away. Some thought them dumb to do so, but others weren't so sure. If Tom can somehow beat all of the students that challenge him, a new order will rise in Slytherin House, and these people that jumped in early will have a better position than the rest of them. That is if Tom can beat every challenger, of course. As the last Slytherin swore herself to Tom, he brought his attention towards the group that wishes to duel him. All right, decide amongst yourselves who will duel me first. I'd like to get this over with swiftly, so I can get some sleep tonight. Chapter 37. Laying Down the Law, Part 3. Soon the challengers sent the first duelist forward. Of course, it's a seventh year that is said to be a fairly good duelist. All right, everyone back up about twenty feet and don't stand behind either of us. We wouldn't want a stray spell hitting any of you, would we? 
As Tom says this everyone scrambled to get in a safe position. Good, now let's draw some boundaries. Tom points his wand to the ground about 15 feet away and calls. Incendio. Fire shoots out of his wand and sticks to the floor as he creates a circle of fire enclosing the two duelists. Stepping foot outside the circle will constitute as an immediate loss. Getting your wand knocked out of your hand, being knocked unconscious, or simply giving up will also constitute a loss. The match will start when this galleon hits the ground. Tom says as he fishes a shiny gold piece from his pocket. Are you ready? Tom simply received a nod as a reply and threw the coin into the air. As the coin flew through the air and hit the ground, the seventh year jumped into action. In Carcerus, Confringo, he calls two different spells one after the other, as lightning flies from his wand. Tom dodges the first binding spell and calls up a shield for the incoming blasting curse. Protego, Confringo, Serpensorsha. Tom blocks the spell and immediately replies with his own. A blasting curse flies from Tom's wand and nearly misses the seventh year as he steps out of the way. Tom calls his last spell and a snake comes sailing out of his wand and lands on the seventh year's neck. The snake constricts around his neck and bears its fangs at the student. If he even thinks of moving, bite him and squeeze until he drops Tom hisses at the snake and it eagerly complies. I've told that snake around your neck to bite you and squeeze if you even think of moving. As Tom says this the seventh year stops and freezes in place. His wand clutched in his hand tightly as he tries to think of how to get out of this situation. Before you get any funny ideas, let me tell you what type of snake you have around your neck at this very moment. That is a king cobra and they are the longest venomous snake in the world. Its bite delivers a tremendous amount of paralysis-inducing neurotoxins. The snake's venom is so strong and so voluminous that it can kill an elephant in just a few hours. As Tom informs the boy, he starts shaking with fright. A all right. I concede. P please, get this thing off of me. He stutters as the snake eyes him as if he were its dinner. That's good. We wouldn't want you to die during the duel, after all. Tom says with a small smile as he turns his attention to the snake. Thanks for the help. You may leave now, Evanesca. Tom calls the snake vanishing spell, and the king cobra disappears. The second the snake left the boy's neck, he collapsed on the ground in utter defeat. You may swear your oath now. Tom says to the boy that just collapsed on the floor. After gathering himself, the seventh year said the same oath as everyone else and took his place among Tom's new group. Next. Tom calls and another challenger enters the ring of fire. This continued until Tom has beaten every single one of the twenty that challenged him in the first place. On the outside, Tom was keeping it together and playing everything off like it was nothing, but on the inside, Tom is dreadfully tired. He's used almost all of his magic within these twenty back-to-back -back duels and would love to just go to sleep right now. That can't happen though, as he has to put up a strong front for these pure bloods. If they see him weakened, they will pounce like waiting predators. Does anyone else wish to challenge me? Tom calls to the remaining students. The students remain quiet, as they just witnessed something amazing. Tom, as a third-year student, just dismantled every seventh-year student that challenged him. Not only were they seventh years, but they were also all well known for being good in duels. Tom just made them look like children and did so one after the other. In the hearts and minds of these people, Tom is unbeatable, and they would gladly serve someone this skilled. Not to mention, he's the heir to the most respected pure blood wizard to ever live. Some still didn't want to serve Tom, but what can they do about it? They can't just challenge him, as they aren't nearly as strong as the students that just lost. How could they ever stand a chance? I will take your silence as your answer. Seeing as none of you wish to challenge me, form a line and start swearing your oaths. Tom orders and they move almost without meaning to. A line is formed and one by one the students swear their loyalty to Tom as their lord. From second year to seventh year, every single one of them swore the oath. 
This includes every member of the inbred faction. Although, they didn't hate Tom anymore. They all looked at him as if he were a god. A god that just showed how powerful he was for all to see. Even Lestrange, who was just tortured by Tom only moments ago, is looking at him in awe and wonder. Although they are obviously crazy, Tom won't try to correct their behavior. It's best to have the crazies on a tight leash. As the last of the students swore their oaths, Druella moves before Tom and goes to swear herself as well. Stop, Drew. What are you doing? Tom says as he stops Druella from kneeling. I'm swearing myself to the new Lord of Slytherin, of course. She said as if it was the simplest thing in the world. No, you aren't. You're my friend therefore you don't have to do anything. Tom says with a smile. No, I have to. I know there are some things you're hiding from me. You don't trust me fully, and that's fine. I don't trust anyone completely, but if I give this oath, I'll be bound by it to stay loyal to you. You can trust me completely after that, right? Tom frowned at this. She is correct that he is hiding things from her. From the ROR to Kamartage, he's been hiding a few things here and there. When he thought about it, he concluded that yes he doesn't fully trust her. It was a dreadfully sad realization, as he is truly grateful to her for sticking by him, but he just found it hard to trust her fully. You're right. Tom admits and she gets on one knee as everyone else did. I, Druella Mary Rosier, swear loyalty to my lord, Thomas Marvelo Riddle. As his servant and friend, I will act as his sword, wand, and shield when need, provide counsel whenever I wish, and keep his secrets even in death. I swear this oath on my life, should I knowingly break it. She says with a smile on her face. She never thought that any of this would happen. She thought that they would trudge their way through Hogwarts while dealing with bullies and other annoyances. Never would she have imagined that Tom would lead the house, nor did she believe that he would bring it under his control in a single night. She truly made the right choice the day she chose to forsake her reputation for friendship. I accept your oath, Drew. Thank you. Chapter 38 Laying Down the Rules, Part 4 Now that Tom is in charge, he needs to start laying down the law. If he wants to gain full control of the castle, he can't just leave things the way they are now. The Slytherin students would just go back to their old ways and act like idiots again. Tom has to lay some rules does so that the house can start moving on the path towards unity. All right, now that you've all sworn your oaths, I have some rules to tell you. After I've informed you of said rules, you may return to your rooms and get some sleep. Tom states as every Slytherin student listens closely. Firstly, to the rest of the school and everyone not in this dimension right now, including the Slytherin first years, I am not the leader of Slytherin House, nor am I even the heir to Slytherin. Tom says as he takes off his air ring and stores it away. I don't wish to reveal too much to anyone just yet. This means that you tell no one anything about me being your lord or reveal anything that has taken place here today. That includes your parents, as I have no interest in hearing from them just yet. The council that was previously in power will remain as a sort of figurehead, but I will be the one steering the ship so to say. Tom informs them and the council members seem all right with this. A figurehead position is still a position, so they at least have some power still. Even if it's a sliver of what it once was. If I am ever indisposed, Druella is in charge. Listen to her as if the orders came from my mouth. Is that understood? Tom asked and received nods all around. Some were unhappy about being placed below a girl, but they wouldn't argue with Tom after all they've seen tonight. A proud smile bloomed on Druella's face as she stands up straighter. This was a good sign for her. Before her oath, there was no way that Tom would put her in charge of his followers. This just proved that it was the right choice to swear the oath to him. Now, on to the new direction that our house will be taking from now on. Tom says and many of the students gulp in anticipation. No longer will Slytherin be the house of racist bullies. We are supposed to be the house of the ambitious and cunning. 
I have no interest in your excuses, nor do I care for your complaints. We have long alienated ourselves from the rest of the school and that stops now. Does anyone have any questions before I move on? Tom asks and one of the more brave students raises their hand. Yes, um, what about the first years? How do we explain the sudden behavior change? One of the elder students asked. They have barely been in this school a single day. Just pretend that the council gave you all a tongue lashing during this meeting and change your behavior. Also, try to guide the newer students to make friends with the other houses. We are the ambitious and cunning, and as such we should be making connections with every person we can. Who knows when we'll need help from someone from another house. Not to mention the future possibility of someone from another house holding a high position in the government. Many of the students are listening carefully and soaking up the information. Most of them seem to agree with Tom's points as they are logical, after all. A few of them still look hesitant, but that will hopefully change as time passes. Now, here's the one that none of you will like, but it has to be done. Starting from tomorrow each one of you will find those that you have mistreated and apologize sincerely. Offer nothing to them and simply say you're sorry and that you will change your ways from now on. This includes those from Gryffindor. Tom says and the whole dimension gets loud with complaints from the students. Silence. Tom yells and all of his followers close their mouths quickly. You will do as I say and you will do it with a smile on your face. I'm not telling you to befriend them immediately, but the fighting between our two houses has to stop. It will stop. As I've said before, we are the house of the cunning and ambitious, not the house of bullies and racists. All of you will apologize to every single person you've ever wronged in this school by the end of tomorrow. I don't care if they've already graduated or not. Send them a fucking owl if you have to, but this will get done. Am I clear? Tom states and everyone voices their agreement swiftly as not to anger Tom any further. Good, along with these changes will come training that all of you must go through. The day after tomorrow, the council will announce a new club called the Gym Club. This club will only allow Slytherin second-year students and up to join. The club will use the room that Druella and I have been using every morning for our training. You will all join the club and every morning you will follow a training regimen set by me. Not only is it set by me, but it's the training that I do every day with Druella. Tom says and every one of them looks interesting in going through whatever training Tom went through to get as strong as he is. Druella just looks at these people with sympathy. They didn't understand that when Tom says training, he means physical training as well. When they're told to run as she did, they'll understand the pain that comes with Tom's training. What about next year when this year's first years can join the club? They haven't sworn an oath as we did. Briar, Druella's brother asks. Every year after the welcome feast, we will hold an open council meeting. The new second years that attend will be brought here and swear their loyalty as all of you have. This will repeat every year going forward from now on. Tom says and the more mentally gifted students get a chill down their spine. Tom is essentially declaring that he would be recruiting every Slytherin to enter Hogwarts from now on. That is a lot of people and a good portion of them are heirs that will become lords down the line. He's pretty much saying that every child to enter Slytherin will serve him. Tom then went on to list actual rules for every Slytherin to follow. These rules will be announced tomorrow by the council to all students, including the first years. They are easy rules to follow like no bullying no stealing, etc. They will be the basis of how the Slytherins will be allowed to act from here on out. That's it. You may leave and get some sleep. Tom announces as he conjures a portal out of the mirror dimension. Chapter 39, Seuss. As the students left the mirror dimension, Druella stayed behind along with Tom. She had some worries and needed to voice them. She also had some questions for Tom to hopefully answer. So, how does it feel to be the second in charge of Slytherin House? Tom asks as he closes the portal after the last student leaves the mirror dimension. It feels good, but I have some worries. 
a good portion of your new followers don't have any acclimacy barriers. If someone were to read their minds, they will know what happened here and the changes to our house. She informs Tom with a grave expression. You don't think I already know this? Tom asks with a small smile on his face. There's nothing I can do about it, but start training them and hope for the best. If someone reads their minds, they can't use that information as it was illegally obtained. All we have to do is not cause any major waves and start their training as soon as possible. I would have trained them today, but the duels lasted longer than I expected. Tomorrow will be spent healing the broken connections between our house and the others, and the next will be the beginning of their training. Hopefully, they can pick up on a clemency quickly. I guess you're right, but people will know that something has changed. The second that every student in Slytherin starts apologizing tomorrow, anyone that has a brain will know that something happened within our house. She voices more of her worries. Let people think whatever they want. Unless they interfere with my plans, I have no interest in them. These things have to be done in order to unite the houses. Tom says and Druella instantly remembers the hat song from their first year. You're the guest, aren't you? She blurts out. Ha. Huh. What are you talking about? Tom asks. The hat song before our sorting talked about the need to unite the broken house. Then it said that we had a guest that year that could bring them together or something. You are who he was talking about, right? She explains her thoughts. Tom took a minute to decide whether to say anything and decided to reveal a bit to his trusted friend this time. She did swear the oath after all. He then went on to explain how he owns the school, but Lady Hogwarts won't give him full control unless he unites the broken houses. You're telling me that you own this entire castle? She asked with awe in her voice. Yes, and the land around it as well. Tom says casually. I hate you. Why do you get this beautiful castle, while my family only owns a manor and a few vacation homes? She says as she starts pouting. You do understand that you're mad at being less rich than me right? You're still rich, you know. Tom says with a sigh as his friend's spoiled behavior is starting to surface. Yeah, but it's not the same. She says as she starts pouting even harder. Would it make you feel better if I said that I own a few other castles as well? Tom says with a teasing smile. Shoot yourself with the killing curse right now. She says as she glares at Tom with mock hate. The next morning, Tom and Druella perform their training as usual. After the normal training routine, they get cleaned up and head to the Great Hall for some breakfast. Along the way, many of the students were gossiping about receiving apologies from Slytherin House. They were talking about how all over the school students are being approached by Slytherins. Not in the usual bad way either. They didn't come to bully them and call them names, but to apologize for all the wrong they have caused them. This was happening all over the school and every Slytherin student was taking part. They must have decided to rip the band-aid off quickly. This way it's done and they can move on with the rest of the day. Druella whispers to Tom and he just nods in reply. When they arrive at the Great Hall, the staff of the school looks pleased and suspicious at the same time. On one hand, the most problematic house in the school is apologizing and stating that it would change its ways. On the other hand, it's all happening far too quickly to not cause suspicion. Especially from Dumbledore who is far too suspicious of Tom to not watch the Slytherin house closely. When Tom and Druella took a seat at the Slytherin table, Dumbledore knew something was up. The students who sat at the table would always shun Tom and Druella but today they seem to be fairly inclusive with them. None of the students shuffled away from them, nor did they start badmouthing them as usual. Is this because they wish to change their ways, or has Tom done something to make them act this way? Dumbledore thought but immediately discarded his assumption. There's no way that boy could pull off something like this. No matter how skilled he is, he can't fix the entirety of Slytherin House so quickly. It must be something else. Throughout the rest of the day, apologies were given left and right from Slytherin students. 
many of the students being apologized to simply accepted it and moved on with their day. Others were suspicious and some were flat out denying the apologies. Those that would deny the apologies more often than not came from Gryffindor. They don't trust snakes and see these apologies as either an act or some sort of evil plan. Hopefully, over time these thoughts will change and the houses will be united. Something else happened that day as well, as a long list of rules was posted in the Slytherin common room. They were said to be sanctioned by the council, and every Slytherin student had to follow them. When the first years read them, they were truly surprised. First, the older students' behavior changes out of nowhere, and now they have rules for everyone to follow. They were truly unhappy with this outcome, especially Walburga Black, who voiced her opinion quite loudly. Of course, Orion, her cousin stepped in and brought her aside to get her on board. He can't have a member of his house angering his lord, after all. The day after the apologies, the council announced the gym club and everyone attended Tom and Druella's training. Tom spent the majority of the training teaching them a clemency, as that is the most important at the moment. After the training and classes, Tom decided that it's time to visit the Chamber of Secrets. He believes that he's strong enough to at least run away from the basilisk if he has to. If worse comes to worst, he could just portal away, and if the snake tries to follow him, Tom can just close the portal on it and kill it. Oh, that would be a good move. Using portals to decapitate people. Tom thought as he went to gather supplies for his adventure to the second-floor girls' bathroom. Chapter 40, Chamber, Part 1 In preparation for going to the Chamber of Secrets, Tom has come up with a plan. The basilisks are said to be killed by the cry of a rooster, so Tom has made a magical recorder out of runes and arrays. The recorder itself wasn't so hard to make, as he just needed it to copy a sound and then play it a single time. He hasn't quite figured out how to save it, so it will only play once after being activated. Just to be totally safe, Tom made two separate recorders. He recorded the sound of some roosters on both devices, as the groundskeeper keeps a few of them. The backup plan for this recorder somehow failing is quite simple. Tom will fall back on the portal away plan if needed, and if the basilisk were to try to follow him, then Tom would be delighted to test out his new move. With his fairly simple plan put together, at midnight Tom sneaks out of the dormitory and goes to the second floor girl's bathroom. Of course, he made sure to be as quiet as possible and keep to the shadows. Although the caretaker of the castle isn't as paranoid as Filch was in canon, so he shouldn't be searching the halls right now. Once inside the bathroom, Tom made sure no one was around. He then closes the door and walked to the sinks. Once he stood by the sink, Tom made sure to listen for any students or teachers wandering the halls just to be safe. As he doesn't hear any footsteps or any other signs of life, he looks to the sink and says the magic word. Open Tom hisses and the sinks open to reveal a dark entrance with a ramp to go down. Stairs he calls and nothing happens. Shrug, it was worth a shot. Tom jumps down the entrance and slides down to the dark abyss below. As he gets to the bottom, Tom slides off and lands on his feet in a dark tunnel. Following the tunnel, Tom doesn't find the skin from the basilisk shedding that Harry found in the movie. Walking along the tunnels, Tom finds another entrance and opens it like the sinks. Open. Tom hisses and the doors open. Inside is a walkway flanked on both sides with waterways that ran through the room and who knows where else. Lining the left and right walls are big snake statues that hover over the waterways. At the end of the walkway is a wall carving of the head of Salazar Slytherin. This is the Chamber of Secrets. Tom takes a minute to take all of this in. He remembers watching Harry's battle against Diary Tom and the Basilisk. He then decided to use this place as a meeting spot for him and his high-level followers. He'll have to make sure that no valuables are lying around before inviting anyone in, of course. Also, whoever would be invited has to be proficient in a clemency, as to protect the chamber's whereabouts. This all depends on my ability to either control the basilisk or kill it. 
Tom thought as he gets ready to open the statue's mouth. Tom opens a portal to the mirror dimension behind him and takes out one of the recording devices with the rooster cry recorded. He then takes a few breaths and readies himself to invite out one of the most dangerous magical creatures in the world. Okay, breath in, breath out. You can do this. Just don't look into its eyes and talk as soon as possible to gain its trust. Tom thought as he centers himself and looks away from the mouth. Speak to me, Slytherin, greatest of the Hogwarts for, Tom hisses as the mouth falls open. Making sure not to look into the abyss of the open mouth, Tom waits to hear something exiting the mouth. The anticipation and the fact that he can't look in that direction is killing him. He waits and waits but as time passes he hears nothing. As soon as the mouth stopped opening and the sound of stone scraping against stone ended, the chamber was bathed in silence as nothing came out of the mouth. Tom waited and waited until he couldn't take it anymore and looked towards the mouth. Nothing was there and nothing seemed to be coming out. Tom cursed his new situation that he's found himself in. Am I supposed to go in or should I try luring the snake out? Tom thought. As Tom was thinking of his current situation and debating on his next step, the water on the left side of the walkway starts rippling. As Tom is staining into the mouth of the statue, the head of the basilisk pokes out of the water to his left. Suddenly, Tom heard the sound of water moving and dripping. He could feel the hairs on his body stand straight up. Turning to his left, while making sure to look only near the floor, he sees the same basilisk from the movie slithering its way out of the water. It looked as ugly and mean as he remembers from the scene. Panic filled Tom's mind as he fights his response to say fuck this and run away. After swiftly getting himself under control, he opens his mouth and hopes for good luck. Hello, I'm the heir to Slytherin. It's nice to meet you, Tom says with a bit of awkwardness as he's ready to press play on the recorder and pounce to the portal at any moment. At first, the snake doesn't answer and simply turns its head sideways for a second. Seeing the basilisk didn't try to eat him yet, Tom started getting hopeful that the basilisk would listen to him. Food. The basilisk kisses and surveys the room for any tasty meals. Food. The snake yells with a crazed look in its eyes as it sees Tom. Well, that answers my question, I guess. Tom says immediately presses the play button on his magic recorder. Amplified sounds of many roosters crying out fill the room. The basilisk cries out and hisses in pain as the audio plays through the room. It writhes and shakes as it falls back into the water and disappears underneath. When Tom sees the basilisk escape under the water, he curses and pulls out the other recorder device. The first one has already ended, so it's best to have the other at the ready. Due to the basilisk vanishing under the water, Tom can't tell whether it died or not. He sticks close to the portal with his back to it and watches the waters around him closely. Soon the water started moving as if something was splashing around beneath it. This spreads to every bit of water in the room, and Tom couldn't tell which side the snake was swimming in anymore. The waters got so turbulent that the water started rising and soaking the walkway Tom is standing on. The water invades his dragon hide boots and soaks his socks completely in water. Fuck, on top of all of this, now I have to deal with wet socks. Tom yells in annoyance, as he hears squishing noises from his shoes every time he takes a step. Chapter 41, Chamber, Part 2 Ignoring the feeling of his wet socks, Tom stays alert with his back to the portal and surveys the surrounding waters. Soon the water stops thrashing and slowly becomes calm once again. Tom eyes the water warily as the calm waters are almost scarier than the earlier waves. As he's watching the water closely, the mouth of the statue hasn't closed. The sound of something scraping on stone could be heard, as orange glowing eyes shine through the open mouth. Hearing the scraping in the statue's direction, Tom fought the urge to look in that direction. He knew the snake was coming from the mouth, so he waited for the perfect chance to press play on his remaining recorder. As the basilisk slithered out of the mouth, Tom could hear it transfer from the mouth to the floor. Immediately, he pressed the play button again. 
Nothing happens. No rooster cry, cluck, or anything. Tom presses the button again and still, nothing happens. Fuck, I must have messed up a rune or something on this one somewhere. Tom cursed inwardly as he taps the button a few more times. As Tom is freaking out over his device not functioning properly, the basilisk has fully exited the statue. At first, it was hesitant because of the loud soul-piercing noises from earlier, but the chamber is perfectly quiet now. Oh, how the crazed basilisk hated that sound, and it knew where it came from. It came from that little food that walked into her home uninvited. How dare a piece of food cause such a great snake such as her such unimaginable pain. With revenge on her mind from the earlier sound attack, the basilisk locked onto Tom, coiled itself, and prepared to pounce. Fuck this. Tom exclaimed as he dashed to the portal. The second Tom made a run for the portal, the snake shot forward like a rocket aimed straight at the tasty food before her. Tom crosses the threshold of the portal into the mirror dimension, but he didn't stop there. No, Tom kept running forward as fast as he could and peeked over his shoulder. The basilisk didn't see anything wrong with the portal and followed Tom in easily. When Tom took a peek over his shoulder, he was met with a close-up look of the basilisk's open mouth ready to take a bite out of him. Before the snake could close its mouth, Tom swiftly closed the portal. As the portal closed, it cut the basilisk clean in half. The front half that entered the mirror dimension started convulsing and shrieking in pain. It no longer chased Tom, nor did it even acknowledge his existence. The back part that was cut is leaking blood at an incredible rate. With every second that goes by, the basilisk starts slowing down and losing the strength to hiss in pain. After about twenty minutes, the basilisk is completely unmoving. Its eyes become dim and it's no longer breathing. Even though Tom knows it's probably dead, he still doesn't dare to step near it, nor does he look into its eyes. He truly doesn't know whether its eyes could still kill with a glance or not. Basilisks are so rare that not a lot has been written about them. Tom has only read a few things here and there. After a moment of making sure that the basilisk is actually dead, Tom opens a portal back to the chamber and sees the decapitated bottom half of the basilisk just sitting there, unmoving. Seeing that he's beat the basilisk, Tom takes a moment to inwardly celebrate. He took on a thousand-year-old basilisk and won. Though he had an easier time thanks to his portals, Tom has still slain a basilisk nonetheless. Pride swells in his chest as he looks over the two halves on either side of the portal. It's too bad that the snake had already gone mad before I got here. I would have gone crazy as well if I was locked down here for who knows how long. The cannon basilisk must have either been saner or cannon Tom did some sort of spell to gain its allegiance. Whatever, the parts can be recycled in the upcoming ritual I've been working on. I wonder if I could incorporate the eyes somehow? Tom starts pondering over ways to enhance his ritual with basilisk parts. As thoughts of cool eye powers race around in Tom's mind, he looks at the two giant halves of the snake. How the hell am I supposed to dismantle this thing and store everything away? It would take me at least a week, and that's with me working non-stop. Tom thought and then decided to put all of the work on his trusty house elves. Mimsy. Yes, Master Tommy? Mimsy appears in the mirror dimension to answers Tom's call. The second the word Tommy leaves her lips, Mimsy looks horrified. She along with a few of Tom's other elves heard a Hogwarts elf call Tom, Tommy. They also wanted to join and so they called him that as well, but her master asked them nicely to never call him that. When she was called by her master just now, the excitement got to her and the name just came out without her thinking. When Tom heard her call him Tommy, his eyebrow twitched and he frowned slightly. I hate that Hogwarts elf. The second I have control over this castle, he's getting the clothes. Tom thought as he cursed the moment he was called Tommy. S sorry, master. Mimsy stuttered as her ears drooped in sadness. It's all right. I know you didn't mean to. Tom says as he pats her bald head. She beams a blinding smile up at Tom as he gives her one final pat. 
Can you assign some of the other elves to dismantle and package all the parts of this basilisk? Both sides, please. Tom says as he points to the portal to the Chamber of Secrets. Also, make sure no one gets any of the poison on them, and don't look into its eyes or you'll die. The second Tom mentioned a basilisk, Mimsy looks over and sees the severed front half just laying there. She suddenly shrieks in fright and hides behind her master's leg, peeking out only every now and then to see the gruesome creature. It's already dead. You have nothing to worry about as long as you follow my directions. Tom says as he gestures to the unmoving snake. Didon be getting venom on us and no staring at its eyes. Mimsy stutters as she comes out from behind Tom's leg. Exactly, and store it all away in one of my properties. Tom says and Mimsy is still watching the basilisk with caution. After showing Mimsy that the snake is dead, she had no problem with getting it dismantled. She called a few elves to help her out and got straight to work. While they were working, Tom opened a portal to his dorm room and went straight to sleep. He has to teach almost every Slytherin student a clemency tomorrow morning, after all. Chapter 42 Training Followers and Electives Christmas break came quickly as always, and Tom has been busy in the months since Hogwarts began again. It only took Mimsy and the other elves two days to disassemble, package, and store away the basilisk Tom defeated. Everything was moved to one of Tom's many manors. This particular manor has a special room that is used to store ingredients over long periods of time. The elves pretty much packed that room to the brim with snake parts and liquids. Everything was saved down to the bones, blood, and spit. Tom searched the whole chamber of secrets and didn't find anything of importance. A few books on parcel magic were stashed away, but he has already seen them in the ROR. Though the books were taken and stored away in Tom's trunk for safekeeping anyway. There was also some potion supplies, but everything was already rotted into nothing. Tom was hoping to find some eggs from the basilisk, but none were found in the chamber. If I want a basilisk, then I'll have to make one myself. Tom thought as he finished searching the chamber. After taking control of Slytherin House, Tom's been training his new followers every day. Many of them were annoyed at waking up so early, not to mention the laborious physical training, but none would speak up against it especially since their new lord was doing it alongside them, and performing the exercises without much effort. After the physical training came the acclimacy lesson that happened every single day. Tom needed these Slytherins' minds protected as swiftly as possible. He doesn't know if anyone has already peeked into their minds or not. If they have then Tom is sure that whoever they are will reveal themselves sooner or later. If no one has read their minds, then Tom's luck must be pretty good. Other than training in the mornings, Tom also ordered them to expend all of their magic every night before bed. They were skeptical at first, but after the first month, they started to see the benefits. Druella has been the greatest help in these past months. When Tom was busy or needed counsel on anything, she would be there to help out. She was truly excited about the new developments in Slytherin House. In a single day she went from the friend of the mud blood to the second in command of the whole of Slytherin, and boy does she love being in charge. She doesn't misuse her power, as that would be detrimental to her friend and lord, but she definitely gets a kick out of ordering everyone around. These people used to talk shit behind her back and some even straight to her face. The feeling of putting all of them in their place was truly euphoric for her. As this is the third year, Tom was able to pick his electives. He and Druella picked the same electives as to stick together. It helped that they both were interested in the same courses. Arithmancy and Ancient Runes At first, Tom wanted to see if he could take all of the courses and get a time turner out of it, but it seems that Headmaster Dippet isn't as giving as old Dumbledore was. Either that or Canon Dumbles had some sort of alternate motive for giving Hermione the time turner. Seeing as he couldn't get a time-turner, Tom and Druella only picked the two electives as nothing else stood out as overly interesting. Arithmancy is a magical discipline that studies the magical properties of numbers, 
including predicting the future with numbers and numerology. Wizards and witches who study and practice arithmancy are called arithmancers. The teacher at Hogwarts is said to be one of the best arithmancers in a very long time. The only problem is the class is all about numbers and gets tiring after a while. Not to mention the homework assignments of which include writing essays that require the consultation and or composition of complex numerical charts. Ancient runes are a form of writing which witches and wizards used thousands of years ago. These runes can be used the same way as normal runes, but usually hold more power than modern-day runes. If Tom were to fully learn ancient runes, he could enhance his future ritual by a good amount. He simply would have to replace some of the more modern runes with an ancient counterpart. The teacher of this class is all right, but Tom has to fight back the urge to fall asleep. The teacher knows what he's talking about, but the delivery is very monotone. Homework for this class is fairly high which is annoying as well. Other classes were continuing as usual. Nothing of note was happening in any of Tom's normal classes. During Tom's alone time in the ROR, he's been looking into the Patronus charm and becoming an animagus. The Patronus charm, Expecto Patronum is the most famous and one of the most powerful defensive charms known to wizard kind. It's an immensely complicated and extremely difficult spell that evokes a partially tangible positive energy force known as a Patronus or Spirit Guardian. It's the primary protection against Dementors and Lethifolds, against which there is no other defense. There are two types of patron uses. First, corporeal which means a Patronus with a particular shape and form, and incorporeal Patronus. Incorporeal patron uses have no particular shape and do not protect against Dementors the way corporeal patron uses do. Tom was extremely excited to see his spirit guardian and practiced the spell like crazy. The problem was that Tom needed a truly happy memory in order to cast the charm. Old Tom's memories were anything but happy, so Tom fell back on the memories of the light soul, Gregory. One memory ended up doing the trick. It was a memory of a very early birthday party, which his mother put a lot of effort in to throw for him. His family wasn't anywhere near wealthy, but his mother saved money throughout the year for him. The day was perfect, and to a child, the perfect birthday party is a truly joyous occasion. It didn't take Tom more than a few weeks of practice to find his birthday memory. When Tom thought of this happy moment, he called out the spell Expecto Patronum, and a light shone from his wand, and an ethereal creature appeared before him. A corporeal thestral the same as the ones that pull the carriages to Hogwarts stood in front of Tom. It looked at him curiously for a moment, nodded its head at Tom as if to say hello, and disappeared back to wherever it came from. Tom was happy with his guardian spirit and tested the spell out many times just to see it again. He also tested out the corporeal and incorporeal versions of the spell. Other than that Tom has read every book available about the animagus change. He wanted to know the best way to become an animagus and hoped he was a cool animal. He may commit suicide if he's a rat-like Pettigrew or a bug-like Skeeter. Tom was hoping for something like a magical creature, but knew that was highly unlikely. He would gladly take some sort of big cat or wolf though. The best way to fully connect with your inner animal, as said in the books in the ROR, is to meditate and find the animal in your inner world. The book said to practice a clemency until he has access to his inner world, which Tom already does. Then once in that inner world, Tom must find a secluded spot and meditate in the inner world itself. Doing so is supposed to attract your inner animal and whatever it is will bond with you. Once the bonding is done to a certain extent, Tom will be able to perform his first shift into his spirit animal. Some books explained a potion that could speed things along by forcing the shift, but almost all of the meditation-style books warned against this. They stated that the bond will be stronger if the connection is earned and not forced. Since starting his inner world meditation, Tom still hasn't seen his spirit animal. He does feel like he's being watched by something, but that something hasn't shown itself just yet. This marks the end of part 5 of the story on Voldemort. Thank you for listening. Please like the video and hit the subscribe button to listen more. 
hit the bell icon to get notified of all the new content uploaded to the channel ASAP.